Greetings. The next section of uh, the book of Ephesians is a prayer that we see Paul offering on behalf of the believers in uh, this church. And it begins with verse 15 of chapter 1. And as he comes to begin this prayer, he uses the phrase, for this reason. And so it begs the question, uh, for what reason? What is Paul uh, thinking of? What's he referring to? Well, he's referring to the verses or to the information he's just shared with us in what we call verses 13 and 14. You recognize, of course, that Scripture was not written in chapter and verse. Those weren't added until sometime in the 1500s, probably around 1525. But it helps us identify passages of Scripture and Paul's referring to verses we looked at last week. Let me read them for you again. This is verse 13 and 14, chapter 1. And you, who were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed you were marked in him, in Jesus, with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Now, what Paul is referring to here and what he is celebrating and praising uh, God for is the fact that because of God's grace, he had always intended the inclusion of Gentile believers in the family of God. The family of God is not reserved for uh, Jewish folk only, his chosen people, but Gentiles like you and me. And Paul qualifies that by saying in the fullness of time, that is to say after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. As he said in verse 9, we looked at last week, the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection paid the debt for our sins, and the rejection of Jesus as their Messiah and as the Son of God by the Jews allowed God, in the fullness of time, as Paul puts it, to reveal his will, God's eternal will and purpose, which was to create what we call the church. The universal church made up of Jews and Gentiles the church universal as we know it today in the 21st century. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection also allowed God to provide the miracle of God sealing believers, saints, sealing us with the mark of himself, the Holy Spirit. Now, it's worth stopping and reflecting on uh, the magnitude of God's grace and love for humanity here. The miracle of uh, God's love for uh, disobedient and uh, rebellious humanity and his love toward us, um, which we see in John 3.16, for God so loved the world. He didn't say he just loved believers. He loves the world that he sent his only begotten son. God in his grace and his sovereignty, uh, the sovereignty of his will and his purpose, his plan, provided redemption from sin we saw that in verse 7. And God had intended since before the creation of the world that he would include Jews and Gentiles in his family through faith, anyone who placed their faith in Jesus. Now, he created the Jewish people through Abraham and Sarah. We see that way back in chapter 12 of Genesis. And he promised the Messiah, Jesus. And the Messiah that would come as promised to Adam and Eve way back in Genesis 3, about a thousand, two thousand years even earlier than Abraham. In the Garden of Eden, God promised a solution to our sin problem. But as time passed, God's sovereign plan was unfolding. Jesus came to earth and was rejected by his people, both the Jews specifically and humanity generally. And now the mystery of God's plan, his purpose, the church was revealed. 
Now, as part of God's family, in our local congregation here in Wallace, or the church that you uh, attend where you live, you were to do what the Jews failed to do, and that is to share God's blessing with those who do not know him and do not have a relationship with him. We are not to keep the blessings that God has uh, bestowed on us for ourselves. That's what the Jewish folks did in the ancient world. We have the good news of God's salvation in Christ. And that reminds me of the words that Paul wrote to the Romans. As he wrote the church in Rome, in chapter 1, verse 16, he writes, I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God. That's God's sovereignty. For the salvation of everyone, anyone who believes. For the Jews first, remember Jesus came to the Jews, and then for the Gentiles. There's that sequence in time. Well, Paul is celebrating this same truth that he wrote to uh, the Romans about here in his letter to the church at Ephesus. Paul's been consistent all through his New Testament writings that the basis of the miracle of God is his purpose for all believers. Every nation, every tribe, every language, every culture, they are to be in Christ through faith. So when you read Paul's words, and you were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, we need to stop and reflect that although Paul never knew that we would even exist in the 21st century, or that we would ever become part of God's family, the Holy Spirit did know. And so he, the Holy Spirit, inspired Paul to write those words so that we, in the 21st century, as believers, could be and would be um, joined with the apostles, the original 12, and the Jewish believers that uh, accepted Jesus as the Messiah, all of the believers and even the Gentiles in the first century to whom Paul is writing here, and uh, all the other places where Paul and uh, Peter and John, all the apostles traveled uh, went uh, with the gospel and uh, uh, spread the word of truth in the ancient world. We are joined with them, those that had uh, believed and those that accepted the offer of forgiveness of sin from God through faith, um, and that they were seen by God as being in Christ because of their faith. You know, that term in Christ is used by Paul 169 times in his writings in the New Testament. It's a powerful phrase. And it expresses in very profound language a spiritual truth. And it describes us as believers. It binds us together with the saints of the ancient world. It is who we are. Saints who are in Christ. You know, the question arises in my mind is, have, have we really grabbed on to uh, the reality of that identity for ourselves and 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 is that how we see ourselves do we see ourselves as in Christ a long line of of believers uh, from the days that Jesus was here on earth we all are connected I pray that Christians would would grab onto that description and see themselves first as Christ followers being in Christ before any other distinction. You know, in our pagan world today, it should be our first and only mark of distinction. We are God's children. We are in Christ, because that is God's sovereign will for us. Just think of the joy that that connectedness and uh, fellowship, uh, that that truth brings to our lives. Uh, the unity uh, it is a unity, and it shreds every other uh, form of distinction. 
denominational, racial, cultural, linguistic. Um, we are one in Christ. And that's how God sees us. And that's how we should see ourselves as being one in Christ. It's exactly what Jesus prayed for. As he walked with the disciples from the upper room where they had celebrated the Passover dinner, and he's walking to the Garden of Gethsemane, he knows he's going to be arrested in just minutes, and he prays to God the Father in front of the eleven. Judas is now gone, and he says, protect them, speaking to the Father, by the power of your name, the name that you gave me, so that they may be what? They may be one as you and I are one. That's a high standard of unity. How changed would you be if that concept of oneness in Christ was a conscious reality in your life every day? How would it change how you think and how you act? Or would it? It is so powerful when we think of it. What a spiritual force the connectedness of believers could be. It's who we are in Christ. It's where I get my preferred title for Christians. I call our, them and myself a Christ follower. Uh, it supersedes all other distinctions. It's how God sees us. Saints, we are Christ followers. Think of it this way. Paul writes in his second letter to the church at Corinth, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Uh, many of you will know that verse. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old has gone, new has come. And this is where the spiritual truth of transformation comes from. We are to be totally new creations. New people in God's eyes. Why? Because we are now, through faith in Christ, we are now in Christ. And Paul says we're a new creature. Totally new. There's a totally new focus in your life. The things of the world have far less value to us. And you are a totally new person. That's where the term being born again comes. Your life has a total focus of meaning and purpose because we're to become more like Jesus. Romans 8, 29. He's the center of our lives now. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. That's God's rule in your life. He didn't say seek only. You don't want to be so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good, but it's a prime focus. It's who we are. Christ followers, members of God's family. But there's a total new unity we have with all of the believers of all of history. Remember a couple of weeks ago, I read to you from Paul's letter to the church at Galatia, the New Testament book of Galatians. In chapter 3, he says this, There is neither Jew nor Greek, nor slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. Chapter 3, verse 26 through 29. There's more to that passage that I didn't read there, but we looked at it a couple of weeks ago. No distinctions. You're either with and in Christ or you're in Adam. We looked at that last week. Now think of the truth of that for a moment. In the world that we live in, in our country specifically, where our governmental leaders intentionally pit segments of society against each other. They divide us by gender, by race, by ethnic origin or economic status. God says those divisions have no consequence in his eyes. He sees you either in Christ or in Adam. There are only two options. And if you are in Christ, you're totally new, a totally new creation. All those old distinctions, they're irrelevant and immaterial. They don't have any weight whatsoever in life anymore. It's no wonder the world hates Christ followers because they can't define us. They can't control us. We don't belong to this world. We're citizens of God's kingdom. Our home is in heaven, not here on earth. 
And so does the reality of these truths to, uh, uh, free you to celebrate who you are in Christ? What can we do to make it uh, this identity so meaningful to us that it defines how we think and how we act in a very practical way in everything we do? How different would our church be here in Wallace, your church would be, if these dynamics that uh, were, were very practically lived out in our lives on a daily basis? Do you think the reality uh, or this reality would draw people to us, to fellowship with us? When everyone, coming to a church where everyone feels Christian love and acceptance, valued, respected as a human being and as a child of God. So we here at Wallace want to change our community. And so we need to bring about change within ourselves. Let this identity change how you think and how you act. Do everything in love for God and in love for other people. Put their good first. That's what Christian love is all about. Being in Christ is um, the reality that overcomes the evil one and the evil we see in our world today. It's the reality that can absolutely change the world. Again, as Paul said in one, Romans 1.16, it's the power of God. Who's going to overcome the power of God? Absolutely, totally no one. It's being alive. And if it's being lived out in us. Finally, being in Christ brings a whole new level of peace and contentment. There's a peace when you are in Christ. You don't get it anywhere else. And it's what people in our world need and seek today. Something that they want, if they see it in us. Peace, hope, joy, love, kindness, patience. Recognize, the, recognize those terms. They're all fruit of the Spirit of God that lives in us. They want what we have. And we need to share what we have with them. It comes from being in Christ, united with other believers, and having the presence of the Holy Spirit in us on a daily basis. The pleasures of the world just can't compete. They don't even come close, certainly not in this world, and certainly not in the world to come. And it all came to you when you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation, and you believed. God gave you himself, his Holy Spirit. What are you going to do for him? That's the question. Let's pray. Father God, we love your word, and we thank you how we are instructed as to who we are in your eyes and what we are to do in response to your love and grace toward us that we're to share, give it away, so that others can have the opportunity to make a choice for themselves, whether to be in your family or not. There's the only two choices, being in your family or not in your family, and it affects the rest of all of eternity. Thank you for these truths, Father. Give us a good week as we live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week.